My sermon today is entitled Copycats, and you'll see why I entitled it Copycats as we get along. The word disciple is used more than 250 times in the New Testament, and I figured it's a pretty important word if it's going to be used 250 times in the New Testament, so I decided that I'd look up in the dictionary to see what the word disciple meant. Well, the word disciple means to copy or to imitate something that you really admire. Now, one way to learn, this is a great way to learn, is through imitation. And humans and animals are uh, great imitators. I was reading the other day about a study that they did uh, at the uh, National Marine uh, Mammal Foundation. A group of people were... Uh, working around a tank full of uh, dolphins and uh, beluga whales. And as they were wa walking around, they heard people talking. They wondered where all the talking was coming from, but then they just ignored it. Until one day, there was a diver that was in the tank, and he crawled out of the tank, and he said, Who told me to leave? And uh, they said, well, nobody told you to leave. And so they got to looking around, and lo and behold, if it didn't come from one male beluga whale that said, get out. Now, evidently, beluga whales, and they didn't realize this, has a, has a unique uh, resonating chamber in their head that uh, they can use in their mimics. And so they learned to talk because of all the people that were around them all the time. And evidently, this one beluga had heard somebody say, get out, get out, so many times that he just said, get out. He's a terrific mimic. I had a friend who had a parrot named Pedro. Uh, when we were down at Bass Academy, uh, we used to go and visit them quite often. And this parrot could mimic his owner to a T. I mean, when you heard the, heard the parrot, you thought you heard Mr. Barker. And one day, it started whistling and calling the dog. It drove the dog nuts because the dog would run in trying to find out where the owner was, where Mr. Barker was. No Mr. Barker, just a parrot sitting in a cage. And it got so bad, because the dog was almost on the verge of having a nervous breakdown, that they isolated the parrot. They put him in another room so he couldn't, you know, bother the dog and tease the dog to death. So, you know, that parrot was a terrific mimic. We're told that uh, babies are famous for copying adults. You've heard it said, you know, she's just like her mother or he's just like his dad. It's amazing. There are people that have never met my son who uh, watch my son and talk to my son and then they say to him, is your dad Tui Pittman? And uh, they say, you talk just like him. You act just like him. Your dad must be Tui Pittman. I, I don't know if that's ever happened to you or not. We had a treasure at, at Bass Memorial Academy. His name was Ken Wright. And he had a little boy who was redheaded just like his dad. And when he walked down the street, there was no mistake. And he walked just like his dad did. His dad had a unique way of walking. And he walked down that street just, just like his dad. There, uh, there are some amazing things that young people do. But, you know, a research has told us that babies as young as six months old are good uh, persons to decide about a person's character. They can, they can evaluate a person at six months old and figure out whether they want to imitate or copy them or not. For instance, if somebody, some adult comes in and there's a box there, and they say, oh, look what's in that box. And the little baby crawls over there and looks in there, and there's nothing in it. They're not going to imitate or copy that person. They distrust that person. At six months old, it's amazing what uh, they can do. Now, the Greek word 
for imitation is mimic. Or you've heard of these mimes, you know, that go around and they act out without saying a word, and you know what they're talking about or what they're acting about by just their body language. And the Greek word for a mimic is a person like an actor who plays a role, but he plays that role so closely that he becomes the person that he's copying. And you're convinced that he's that person because he, he acts that role so closely. Now, we're, we're all born imitators. When um, I was a boy of eight years old, I decided that I'd like to learn to play the saxophone. And my mother moved from California to Tennessee. I didn't really practice a lot. I'd rather play football and baseball and play around with the kids, but not practice. I liked the sax, but I did not practice. Well, then one day she came in and she says, I found a saxophone teacher for you, Tui. His name is Mr. Spaghetti. Well, I got his name confused one time, and I called him Mr. Spaghetti, but he was an Italian, and he taught a uh, high school band. But in, at night, he uh, moonlighted playing the saxophone in a, in a jazz band. Now, I don't know how he convinced my mother, who was a very straight-laced Seventh Adventist, but he convinced my mother to let me go with him to a nightclub at Printer's Alley in Nashville. And there was a fellow there in Printer's Alley in Nashville that owned a nightclub. His name was Boots Randolph. I don't know if any of you ever heard of Boots, but at one time he was a very famous saxophone player, and one of the songs he made popular was Yackety Sax. And uh, so Mr. Spassetti took me to this nightclub. I think I was about 12 or 13. And we went to the back end of the nightclub, and we sat there in this, in this table in the dark, and we listened to Boots play the saxophone, and I was excited and thrilled. I'd never heard anybody play a saxophone like that. And after the, uh, the, the concert or after the program, Boots came over and sat down at our table and talked to us and talked about the saxophone and how to play the saxophone, and I was really excited. And when we left that nightclub, went out to the parking lot and got into a car, Boots said to me, how'd you like to play like Boots? And I said, whew, I'd love to play like Boots. And he said, well, you know, he didn't get that way without practice. He didn't get that way without effort. And he says, if you're going to play like Boots, you need to start practicing. That inspired me. I wanted to play like Boots. Well, when I got into college, I went to Southern Missionary College and I thought I could really play the saxophone. And they invited this man by the name of Sigrid Rasher. Well, there's Boots, but let me give you Sigrid. Sigrid Rasher. At that time, he was the best saxophone player in the world. Nobody could play the saxophone like Sigrid Rasher. Now, I thought Boots was good, but Sigrid... There wasn't any comparison. That night at the concert, he played the flight of the bumblebee on his saxophone without using one note, just with his mouth. And he could play the saxophone one octave higher than anybody else could play it. It was amazing the things that this man could do. Nobody could beat Secret. He was the best. So I determined, even though I knew it was almost an impossibility, that my next model for playing the saxophone was going to be Sigrid Rasher. Now, um, the Latin word for um, disciple means one who imitates a model they admire. Now, when I was a teenager, there weren't a lot of models that you could admire but there were a lot of models that we imitated. One was Elvis Presley. And I don't re know how many of you were, were young at the time when Elvis was in his prime, but I remember people would wear, all these teenagers would wear their collars up around their neck, and they had the long sideburns, and everybody had their hair. They combed like Elvis Presley. They wore shoes like Elvis. 
And then along came the Beatles. And everybody wanted to sing and act like the Beatles. And of course, they weren't good role models either because they were on drugs and they believed in this mystic religion and all these kind of things. And their ideas influenced a whole generation of young people. Now, that to me is not somebody you could model. But then there are things that are worth imitating and are worth modeling. And I remember reading the other night a passage that's found in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, verse 1. And this is what it said. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am a follower of Christ, or I am a Christ. Now, that seems kind of presumptuous for Paul to say, follow me, right? But during the time of Paul, was there a New Testament? There was no New Testament. And the only example that people had of what Christ was like were those that were still alive that had followed him personally or had been involved personally with Christ. Had Paul been personally involved with Christ? On the road to Emmaus, remember, he was struck down, he had a vision, he talked to God, he talked to Christ. So Paul felt like he could call himself a disciple, right? Because he had personally had a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so what he was saying to the others, not, it wasn't, let's open up our New Testament and read about what Christ was like, because they couldn't do that. But what Paul was saying is, follow me. I'm trying to be an example of what Christ lived and what Christ was like. Now, I was raised in a single parent home. My father was killed when he was 35 years old. I was six years old when my father was killed. And so uh, when I became a teenager, my mother decided that I needed to have a good male role model. So she sent me down to, to South America, down to Peru. And uh, I got the opportunity to uh, travel around uh, Peru with a man by the name of Bill Jamerson. He was a big, hefty guy, looked like a football player to me. He was all man. Unfortunately, my mother decided that I needed to learn Spanish because I had forgotten most of my Spanish. And she thought I ought to learn it again. And so there was an old maid professor of Spanish from Walla Walla College that was down in Lima. And she was studying a classical Spanish at one of the universities there. And so she thought that I ought to learn how to read and write and speak classical Spanish, the Castilian-type Spanish, the hoity-toity type of Spanish. So I spent all my day learning how to conjugate verbs and pronounce words and all of this. Tell you the truth, I got bored. I thought she was probably 100 years old. She was probably only about 55. I was sick and tired of her. And then one day she got acquainted with Bill Jamerson. She met Bill Jamerson, and he was the guy that I was supposed to spend my time with. And he slaughtered the Spanish language. You know, he misconjugated his verbs. He used English words thrown in with Spanish words. It was a disaster. And so she wrote my mother, and she said, if you're going to let your son associate with this man, I can't teach him Spanish anymore because he's going to ruin him. Luckily, my mother saw other good traits in Bill than his speaking skills. And so she said, well... He went down there to role model with a man, a good Christian man. And so that's more important than role modeling with an old professor of Spanish. And so I started, you know, going on trips with Bill Jamerson. And you talk about an adventure. We went everywhere. He taught me how to pull teeth. And uh, we pulled buckets of teeth. We went all these little towns all over Peru. We rode on mules and horses. We were like out in the Wild West, you know. You just rode all over the place on these horses and mules, and I could tell you stories of adventure after adventure that we had during the four or five months that I was with Bill. We went down into the jungle, and we stayed in the jungle, and uh, we just did all kinds of stuff together, and Bill was the greatest role model he could be because he taught me 
that being a Christian was an adventure. And that being a Christian wasn't for just sissies. And uh, he convinced me that that's where life was, living a Christian life. So I'm glad that my mother gave me that role model. Now, Ephesians, the uh, fifth chapter, verse 1, was our text for this morning. And it tells us that we need to be imitators of the best. Right? That we need to imitate Jesus. Just as children imitate their parents, so we ought to imitate Jesus. Because? Because Jesus is the greatest man that ever lived. He was perfect. And uh, to put it in a nutshell, you can't get any better than he was or that he is. In order to imitate Jesus, you have to believe that he's the most magnificent person that ever lived. You've got to believe that imitating him is worthwhile. In Matthew, the 13th chapter, verses 44 to 46, we're told that the kingdom of heaven is of immense value, right? You can't get anything better than the kingdom of heaven. It's worth everything to have it. And you remember the story they told about the pearl of great price, that the man was willing to sell everything that he had in order to obtain it? And you remember the story about the other treasure that was buried, and the farmer was willing to give up everything in order to go buy that field? Well, do you think that these individuals, the businessman, do you think he was worried about the cost? He was only worried about whether he could close the deal, right? Now, do you think this business, the farmer was worried about the cost of buying the field? No. He was only worried about whether he could buy the field. Now, the entire passage of Matthew, the 13th chapter, tells us that if anything is more valuable than Jesus in your life, you've lost it. Counting the cost is not moaning and groaning, saying how terrible that I have to give up these things. Counting the cost is saying, hey, it's worth every penny in order to have it. Unless you see the, the value of what we receive from following Jesus, you cannot succeed in being a good imitator. He has to be the most important thing in your life. Do you recall the story of, um, well, let me tell you. Why do you follow Jesus? Because of who he is and because of the rewards that we're going to receive in heaven. Can you imagine Spending all eternity with Jesus. You know, we could spend the whole afternoon, whole morning, talking about the wonderful benefits of heaven. And that's why it's worth imitating and following Jesus. Jesus calls us to follow him. And uh, when we do, we re reap the rewards. Do you remember the story of Peter and Jesus? when uh, Peter and the disciples had been fishing all night, and then they came back to shore, and Jesus had breakfast ready for them. And then he called Peter aside, and he asked Peter this question, Peter, do you love me more than these? And he was pointing to the fish. And I think what he was talking about was, do you love me more than your material blessings? Are you willing to give up everything for me. And Jesus went on to explain to Peter that being his disciple meant an early death. And yet Peter was willing to give up everything, even crucifixion, have crucifixion, in order to attain the glories of heaven. What a, what a decision. You know that I love you. I will follow you. I will give up everything for you because I know the rewards that await me. Now, Jesus calls us to be followers of him, and it means we live our lives as 
he would live. Probably the greatest example for me personally, the greatest role model, was my mother. And uh, I, I can remember that my mother's life was dedicated to helping others. She wanted her live her life as Jesus would live his life. And I remember one time there came a decision between a Cadillac and a Volkswagen. My mother was a pediatrician. She made a lot of money. And she asked herself the question, what would Jesus do? And she figured Jesus rode around on a donkey. Most of the time he walked. So maybe a Volkswagen would do it. And she said to herself, look at the money I'm going to save by driving around in a Volkswagen. And she used that money to help other people help students go through school, help needy people in the church. She always looked for ways to help others. You know, and I, I've seen her, st when I was young, she would stay up all night with a patient in the hospital. Even though she didn't have to, she did it. Because that's what Jesus would have done. Now, I've got a next door neighbor that I've been mowing the lawn for most of the summer. She's an old widow lady. She's the most obnoxious person I know in my life. She's the biggest gossip. In fact, one time she threatened to sue us because we told her we'd like to cut a root down on one of her trees because it was messing up my lawnmower. And, you know, I got to thinking, why am I doing this? You know, I'm treated this way. Then I got to asking myself, how was Jesus treated? And what would Jesus do for this lady? And I decided, well, Jesus would mow her lawn, no matter what the abuse was. And lo and behold, if the other day she didn't come by and say thank you, that first time she's ever said it in three or four years, you know. Thank you for mowing my lawn. But we ought to constantly ask ourselves the question, you know, what would Jesus do? Consider your job. Whether you're a plumber, whether you're a dentist, whether you're a nurse, whatever job you have, you ought to constantly ask yourself, how would Jesus do this job? And what would he do? Um, whether you're making tacos, whether you're teaching children, selling audible bills, whatever. We need to ask ourselves a question, what would Jesus do? A few years ago, there were a group of salesmen, and they went to a meeting in Chicago. And they were really busy, and they were late getting to the airport, and they got to the airport, and they went through the ticket counter, and they were really busy trying to get through there, and they had to rush to the gate to get on the plane. And as they were running through the lobby of the airport, there was this little girl there with a stand of apples that was selling apples, and they hit that, one of them hit that apple stand and scattered apples all over the floor. And they kept on running because they were late. They'd call their wives and they told them that they were going to be home on Friday afternoon, time for supper. And one of the men, you know, his conscience got to bothering, and he stopped and he yelled at the others, tell my wife I'm going to be late. I'll have to catch another flight. And then he turned around and he went back and he started picking up the apples. That girl was around on the floor looking for her apples. He didn't realize that she was blind, couldn't see anything. She was feeling around on the floor trying to find the apples and she was, tears were coming down her eyes. He finally gathered up all the apples and the ones that were bruised and beat up he put in a different little basket he pulled out a $20 bill out of his pocket and he put it in her hand and he said, I hope we didn't mess things up too bad for you. And then he turned around to leave. And as he was walking down the hallway towards the, the uh, gate, she called out, Mister! And he stopped and he turned around and he looked at her, those sightless eyes. And she said, are you Jesus? Well, for the rest of the, the flight home, he sat there and he thought, do people think I'm Jesus? Jesus.
And the question I want to ask you this morning is, do people as they see you and the way you relate to them believe that you are like Jesus? Jesus.